uh, Ryan O'Donnell. Okay, is the mic on? Yeah, I guess it is. Great. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, Boolean functions in this talk, and I'll start by introducing a notion of quasi-random Boolean functions. Okay, so for me, I like to write um, Boolean bits as minus one and one, so a Boolean function for us will be a function f mapping sequences of n bits into one bit. And here's the rough definition. We'll say that such a function is quasi-random if the following thing holds. Um, no matter how you fix, let's say, a constant number of the input coordinates, it doesn't change the bias or the expectation of f by that much. Okay, so every time in this talk, when I say expectation, I would mean with respect to a uniformly random chosen string x from minus 1, 1 to the n. And uh, if you can distinguish it, I don't know if you can, I'll use boldface for random variables. Okay, so this is the average of f's values, and this says that, you know, you can't change it by more than, let's say, little o of 1 by sort of forcing some input coordinates to be constant. Okay, so let's do some examples before we get a proper definition. Um, so here are the canonical examples of quasi-random Boolean functions. And I guess I should also apologize, you know, with respect to Fan's talk, I'm sort of muddling notation as always by introducing this word quasi-random, pseudo-random, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so perhaps the most quasi-random function, although it doesn't look too random, is the constant functions, plus or minus one. The expectation of, let's say, the constantly one function is one, and you can't change that at all by fixing input coordinates. Okay. Another very uh, canonical example is the majority function, which in this minus one notation, minus one one notation, you can write as the sign of the sum of the bits, assume n is odd. Um, its expectation is zero, it's equally likely to be plus or minus one on a random input. And you know, if you fix a constant number of input bits, let's say to one even, it still won't change the expectation by more than little o of one. Uh, another good example is what we call the parity function in computer science. You can write this simply as just the product of all the bits. And uh, its expectation is zero. And indeed, you can't change the expectation from being zero unless you fix all of the bits. If even one bit remains in the input unfixed and equally likely to be plus or minus one, the bias is zero. Finally, it's a sensitive, sensible notion of quasi-randomness because pseudo, uh, random functions have this property with high probability. They'll have bias very close to zero, expectation very close to zero. And this will be true even for when you fix a constant number of input coordinates. It's also very important to look at non-examples. Okay, so the canonical non-example of a quasi-random function is uh, what has this uh, fanciful name in computer science, dictators. You might just call it a projection function, we'll call it a dictator. There are n such functions, one for each coordinate, and it's just f of x equals xi. Okay, so the expectation of this function under a random x is zero, because this is equally likely to be plus or minus one, but you just have to fix that one coordinate and you can make the expectation either one or minus one. So that's a constant jump. So this is definitely not quasi-random. Uh, generalizing this example with an even more fanciful name, uh, we call functions uh, junta, roughly speaking, if they only depend on a constant number of the input coordinates, despite, you know, ostensibly being on n bits. And uh, they'll similarly have the property of not being quasi-random, um, at least assuming they're not constant functions. Okay, so these are the canonical non-examples of quasi-random functions. Um, so to give the, the formal definition, I need to remind you about Fourier analysis, which we already saw in Ben's talk and Lucas' talk. Um, it's actually not even really Fourier analysis in some sense. I prefer to think of it as, you know, expressing a function as a multilinear real polynomial. So if you have a function uh, from minus 1, 1 to the n, think of this as 2 to the n points in Rn into the reals. You can express it as a, a multilinear polynomial. So uh, in general, you have a monomial depending on some subset s of the n coordinates. And you take a sum of these with some you know, cons uh, real coefficients, which we write as f hat s. Okay, so in this setting, these are actually the Fourier characters, if you will, and these are the Fourier coefficients. Okay, so here's some basic, the, just the basic facts we'll need for this talk. Uh, the constant coefficient here, the empty product is considered to be one, is uh, the same thing as the expectation of f under a random input. Uh, the Plancherel or Parseval identity is just uh, this, the sort of the correlation between f and g on a random input x is equal to like the sort of inner product of the Fourier coefficient vectors. And a uh, corollary of this, if you take g equals f, is just that um, the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients is equal to the expected square of the function f, okay? And if you're concerned with Boolean valued functions, functions that map into minus one, one, then this square is always one, meaning that the sum of the squares is always one. So this is quite convenient. You can think of the Fourier coefficient squared as sort of, I don't know, non-negative weights on the subsets s, 
the monomials S that always add up to one. Okay. So with these uh, definitions in hand, I can now give you, let's say, a formal quantitative definition of quasi-randomness. So it actually involves two parameters, epsilon and delta. We'll say such a function is epsilon delta quasi-random if uh, all of the Fourier coefficients are smaller than epsilon absolute value. Uh, for subsets S of cardinality strictly positive and less than 1 over delta. I know it looks a little weird, like why did I make this delta and 1 over delta, but please just bear with me. Um, so roughly speaking, it's saying that there's no large low degree Fourier coefficients, okay, except possibly the empty one, which represents the, the expectation or bias of the function. Um, so it's similar to the notion that uh, Ben introduced in his talk, except that um, for him somehow all the Fourier characters are created equal. Um, whereas for us, you know, the, the Fourier characters are distinguished by their cardinality. You know, we, we care about the small ones and less about the large ones. Okay? Um, so in, in the language that Luca used in his talk, we say that f is quasi-random if it's indistinguishable from a constant by juntas, you know, by s characters of constant size, or equivalently juntas. Um, or maybe another way to look at it is, you know, a function f is it's quasi-random if somehow its structure does not suggest any particular coordinate. You know, no one coordinate or let's say small set of coordinates really makes a big difference to the function. Uh, okay. So that'll be our notion of a quasi-random function. I should say that uh, this definition becomes stricter as epsilon and delta become smaller, so you get sort of a hierarchy. And also, kind of like uh, Ben, I'm going to be kind of sloppy and like, not too care too much about these epsilons and deltas. So just think of them as really tiny constants. And don't, don't worry about the parameters too much. OK. So uh, I gave you a rough definition of quasi-randomness on the first slide, that you know, somehow fixing a small number of coordinates cannot change the expectation by very much. So I leave it as an exercise for you to show that that's essentially equivalent up to you know, getting the parameters right to this notion. So if f is epsilon delta quasi-random, it's equivalent to that every restriction on at most 1 over delta coordinates can't change the um, function's expectation by an amount that depends on epsilon. Okay. Great. OK, so again, as we saw in earlier talks, it's very nice to look at the sort of um, distinction between structured functions and quasi-random functions and how functions can sort of be put into this dichotomy. Uh, for us, you know, structure will even be uh, something much simpler. We'll just look at the ultimate non-quasi-random functions, dictators. Okay? So we're going to, in this talk, often sort of think about the difference between dictator functions, these are just the projection functions, and quasi-random functions. Okay? So I'm going to give you a little example of that to sort of illustrate the point, and that will involve uh, studying the following quantity of a Boolean function, the sum of the squares of its degree one Fourier coefficients. Okay, I want to analyze this quantity for Boolean functions in light of this distinction between uh, dictators and quasi-random functions. OK, so let's uh, start with some easy observations. How can we upper bound this? Well, we know that the sum of the squares of all of the Fourier coefficients is at most 1. So certainly this is at most 1. And equality is certainly achieved if f is a dictator or the negation of a dictator, right? Because here's the Fourier expansion of f right here. It just has one non-zero Fourier coefficient with value plus or minus 1 at degree 1. Okay. In fact, it's, uh, this is an if and only if condition. This is a very easy exercise to check that these are the only functions achieving equality. So that's good. We sort of solved the problem at first. Now, we should always work a little bit harder and maybe try to get a, a, a stability or robustness version of this result. So uh, that was actually provided by a theorem of Frege, Kalai, and Naor. It's not too hard, but I can't really leave it as an exercise. It's harder than that. Uh, they showed that if a function, a Boolean function, has uh, 1 minus epsilon uh, sort of Fourier squared coefficients at level 1, then in fact it has to be quite close to either a dictator or a negated dictator. Okay? This means that the two functions differ on an O of epsilon um, fraction of the 2 to the n uh, inputs. Okay? So that also looks pretty good. In some sense it feels like we've really solved the problem, but it's still not quite satisfactory because you know, these dictators don't really look like genuine functions on n coordinates, right? I mean, they only depend on one coordinate seems sort of unfair. So we can sort of try to exclude these cases by you know, considering instead the set of quasi-random functions. Okay? And what goes on with quasi-random functions? Okay, so let's assume that f is epsilon delta quasi-random, uh, meaning all its Fourier coefficients of degree up to 1 over delta are at most epsilon. And actually, this is not the best illustration of quasi-randomness, this problem, because actually for this argument, you only need epsilon 1 quasi-random. 
Okay, which means that all the Fourier coefficients at degree exactly one are small. Okay, but well, let's, let's go with that for now. Okay, and once you're dealing with uh, Fourier coefficients of degree one, it's kind of annoying to use this set notation because these are all singleton sets. So let me just write it as f hat i is at most epsilon in absolute value for each i equals one through n. Okay, so now we want to study this quantity, the Fourier sort of weight at level one, the sum of the squares of the degree one Fourier coefficients. And uh, here's how we're going to do it. Um, we're going to introduce this function L of x, which is a real valued function on binary strings, Boolean strings. And it's just the linear part of f's Fourier expansion. Okay, so whatever f is, just define L of x to be this thing, sum of f hat i, which is degree one Fourier coefficient, times xi. Okay, and having done that, it's very easy to see that this quantity is nothing more than the expected value of f of x times l of x, where again, x is a random uh, Boolean string, and that's by the Plancherel identity. Here's the Fourier expansion, if you will, of l, so you just pick up all the degree one Fourier coefficient squared. Okay, good, so we've got this equality. Now here's the only place where we'll use the fact that f is Boolean valued, that f's values are plus or minus one. We can simply say that this is at most the expected value of the absolute value of L of X. Okay, that's straightforward. Um, and now we'll just have essentially equalities for the rest of the argument. Okay, so what can we say about this quantity here? Well, L of X, you know, when X is randomly chosen, you can think of it as like the a linear combination of random, independent, random, plus or minus one bits. Okay, so by the central limit theorem, or like a quantitative version of the central limit theorem, you kind of know that this random variable, L of x, acts like a Gaussian, okay? And uh, that uses, in particular, the fact that all of the, these coefficients are small. They're smaller than epsilon. That came from the quasi-randomness assumption. Okay, I mean, if one of them was one and the rest were zero, then this random variable would act like, you know, a Rademacher, plus or minus one uh, bit. But if they're all small, some quantitative version of the central limit theorem, maybe the barry sn theorem, or let's say, uh, implies that this random variable acts like a Gaussian, up to some kind of error epsilon. Okay. And therefore, you know, when you suitably apply the theorem, um, you get that this expectation is within constant times epsilon of the expectation of the appropriate Gaussian random variable. Okay. And by appropriate, I mean it's the one that has the same mean and variance as L. So its mean is zero, and its variance is the sum of the squares of the coefficients, right? That's the variance of this guy when x is randomly chosen. Okay, and now we're done, right? We can do a calculation. We just need to know the expected, you know, first moment, absolute first moment of a Gaussian. If it were a standard Gaussian, it would be root 2 over pi. You do that by little integration. And you should uh, and additionally multiply by the standard deviation, which is the square root of the sum of the squares of the coefficients. And uh, you see, now we're done, right? Because uh, we have this thing appearing here and here, so I'll divide by the square root and then square everything. Okay, divide by, the square, divide by this in square, and I get this result. Okay, the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients is at most two over pi plus this error term O of epsilon. Okay? And that's much different from what we had with dictators, right? Which could achieve and do achieve one. Okay, so there's a big gap somehow between these two classes, dictators and quasi-random functions. Okay, I should also mention that if you do arithmetic combinatorics and you know Chang's theorem, this is essentially how you can also prove Chang's theorem, although you don't need uh, this assumption. Okay, Chang's lemma, I guess. So, uh, you know, what we've just accomplished here is what I'll call for this talk uh, a very simple theorem, the one versus two over pi theorem. It says that the sum of the squares of the degree one Fourier coefficients of a Boolean function is one if f is a dictator, one of the n dictators, but it's at most two over pi if f is quasi-random, okay? And here I'm starting to get sloppy by not putting the parameters in here, but this should be understandable, I hope. Okay, good. Um, so that's all I want to say for now about quasi-random functions. So now I want to take a big detour that'll look completely unrelated uh, to discuss constraint satisfaction problems. So you'll hear much more about this in Dimitris' talk tomorrow. Uh, and I'll also refer to them as CSPs, sorry for all the acronyms that will come up. So these are, uh, this is, we're in computational complexity now. This is an algorithms problem or a class of algorithms problems, okay? So what's a constraint satisfaction problem? Instead of quite formally defining, I'll just give you some examples. So there are always three ingredients. You have a set of variables, which I'll call V1 through Vn. You have an alphabet uh, sigma, which is just a finite set. And think of it as very small. I think it'll be mostly of cardinality two in this talk. 
And uh, the goal is to sort of assign a value from the alphabet to each of the variables. And there's also a certain type of constraints. Okay, so what I mean here, I'll illustrate by an example. Suppose sigma is the set of just true and false, and the constraints on the variables are three airy Boolean disjunctions. Then uh, in computer science, we call the associated CSP max three set. Okay, maybe you've seen three set before. Let me give you the picture here. So in max three set, I mean, this was like the setup for max three set, but it's an algorithms problem and it has an input or an instance, which I'll write by this script I. Okay, and the instance is like a list of constraints, which in our case, as we said, are you know, Boolean disjunctions uh, of uh, arity three. Uh, usually when you write it, you just write, you know, like V1 or V2 or V3, but I want to emphasize that there's uh, an assignment function F, which maps the variables to the alphabet, true or false, okay? And the task, it's an algorithm's task. You get this explicitly written down as an input. There's maybe some linear and n number of constraints. And your goal is to, you know, find an assignment to each of the variables from the alphabet that makes as many constraints true or satisfied as you can. Okay. Um, okay. So let me give you a couple more examples and then hopefully you'll get the picture. Um, imagine sigma is also of size two, but we think of it as, you know, the field of size two, zero and one, mod two. And the constraint types are three variable linear equations, okay? Then in that case, the associated algorithmic task has the, you know, name max three lin mod two, okay? So the max three lin mod two problem, it's a little cut off here. The input to that problem is like a list of uh, three variable linear equations, all mod two, okay? And your task is, again, to find an assignment to the variables that are, you know, zero or one that satisfies as many of these constraints as you can. So it's a system of linear equations, but it might be overdetermined. So there might not be an assignment that satisfies everything, but you're trying to find sort of the best one you can. Uh, let me give one more example. Uh, suppose this alphabet we write is minus one and one, and we have non-equality constraints. Then this one we call max cut. You know, you probably remember it from uh, uh, Russell's talk and also Lucas' talk. There we stated in terms of partitioning the vertices of a graph into two parts to maximize the number of edges that go between the two parts. But you can think for a second and see it's the same problem as this. You get an input, and, you know, which is just a list of constraints that look like this. F of V1 should differ from F of V2. F of V2 should differ from F of V4, et cetera. And you're trying to label these variables by plus or minus one to satisfy as many of these constraints as you can. Okay, so these are all some basic algorithmic tasks. Um, and I have to add one more twist. It's not a big deal, which is that we also allow in the input weights. So instead of trying to, you know, care about each constraint equally, maybe there's some weight P1, P2, P3 for each of the constraints, which, you know, governs the extent to which you really want to satisfy it. Oh, man, it's really cut off here. Well, this says that they add up to one. Uh, we can assume that they add up to one without loss of generality. And then, you know, to state the task more formally, We'll say that the value of assignment F is just the total weight of constraints that it satisfies. And sort of, you know, the thing you're shooting for will write as opt of script I. So given an instance, it's the maximum possible value achieved by an assignment F. Okay, so both of these numbers are between zero and one by virtue of the fact that the total weight is one. Okay, so these are all algorithmically hard problems. I mean, this dates back to, you know, the work of CARP in 1972. I say even for MaxCut here because I sort of think of MaxCut as the simplest possible example of an interesting CSP. I mean, it's just unequality constraints. And he showed that finding a, a, an assignment that achieves the optimum is an NP-hard task. So, I mean, it's presumed to be intractable by efficient algorithms. And let me just quickly remind you how, like, the proof of such a statement works. Um, it's a reduction from any problem in NP, or you can fix a, you know, a problem that's complete for NP, like formula sat. It's an efficient reduction from, a, a, let's say, a formula phi to a max cut instance i. And uh, once you write down the reduction, you also have to prove two results. You have to show that if phi is satisfiable, at least this is the way Karp did it, then the optimum of this instance will be 5 6 The best assignment will satisfy 5 6 of the inequality constraints. You also have to prove that if it's unsatisfiable, the optimum is strictly less than 5 6 Okay, and that, that establishes that this problem is essentially at least as hard as this problem. If you could always find the opt here, you could decide formula satisfiability by first taking your formula, apply the reduction, and then make this decision. Okay, so that, it, that shows that this result is hard, assuming P does not equal NP. 
OK, good. Now, um, we can look at more refined kind of statements of this nature. So although the, prompt, the task of finding the absolute optimum is hard, we have the following stronger result, which is equivalent to the PCP theorem from the early 90s, um, which is that if I give you a max cut instance that happens to have optimum value 5 6, not only is it hard to find an assignment of value 5 6, it's even hard to find one of value 5 6 minus some tiny constant, like 10 to the minus 10. Okay? Which maybe doesn't look that dramatic, but what it shows is that you cannot, assuming NP does not equal to NP, get arbitrarily close to the optimum. And that's different from some problems where you can, like the knapsack problem or the Euclidean uh, traveling salesperson problem. Okay? So it shows you can't even get arbitrarily close to the, the optimum. So that was a very uh, difficult and important result. Now, what about on the other side? What can you do algorithmically? So a very nice result of Gomans and Williamson from 1994. They gave an explicit, you know, efficient algorithm, and they show that it has the following guarantee. Well, it's something stronger than this, but in particular, if you run it on an instance of max cut where the optimum is at least 5, 6, it's guaranteed to find an assignment f whose value is this strange looking number, half plus 1 over pi arc sine 2 thirds, okay? which happens to be 0.73. Okay? Um, it's kind of mysterious. It's a very sophisticated geometric algorithm. Um, but it has a fairly nice guarantee. I mean, you know, it gets, if the optimum is this big, it gets something kind of reasonably large. Okay. So let's put these two results that let's say we know about the max cut problem into uh, some common notation. Uh, I want to make this definition. I'll say that uh, a C comma S approximation algorithm is an algorithm which has the following property. It doesn't have to be a max cut. It can be about any CSP. You have to prove that if the optimum is at least C, then the algorithm will always give you an assignment F with value at least S. All right? This C and S looks funny. It actually stands for completeness and soundness for reasons that we may see later. OK, so just to restate the results we saw from the previous slide, uh, the PCP theorem shows that getting a 5, 6, comma, 5, 6, minus 10 to minus 10 approximation algorithm for max cut is an NP hard task. Okay? Whereas the Gomans Williamson algorithm shows that, you know, Getting a 5, 6, 0.73 approximation is a task that's in P or BPP. Well, it's also in P. OK, so there's still something that remains here. For example, we could pick a number between these two numbers, like 3 quarters, and say, what about this problem? Is there an algorithm that you know, achieves this kind of approximation for max cut? And the answer is that this is currently known, unknown. Uh, it's not known to be NP nor to be NP hard. So actually, it has the same status as factoring or graph isomorphism. You know, it's a problem that we cannot classify. And it's a pretty natural one, too, I would think. So that's uh, a shame. Now, one thing we do know, and we will see later in this talk, is that it's not NP hard, but we'll see it's something called UG hard. Okay? So if you're not uh, all hep to this uh, complexity theory terminology, just pretend that UG hard is the same thing as NP hard, although that's controversial. And if you are hep to this stuff, then you know the whole story, so I don't need to tell you anything more. But for the purposes of this talk, we'll pretend that this also means that it's computationally difficult. OK. So uh, after setting that up, I want to tell you um, a little bit about algorithms for constraint satisfaction problems. And I would say that there are basically two algorithms that you can try for a given constraint satisfaction problem, the trivial algorithm and the sophisticated algorithm. Okay? The trivial algorithm is the random algorithm. It's the, oh, I should say when I mean this one, for the, those in the know, I mean the Raga van der Steurer version. Okay? Uh, the trivial algorithm is the random algorithm. Just pick the assignment at random. I mean, don't even look at the input constraints. Just make the assignment randomly. It doesn't look that smart. Uh, it has one virtue, though, that it's very easy to analyze how good it is as an approximation algorithm. Okay, we'll see an example of that in a second. Uh, the other algorithm is this super sophisticated one, which is called STP, standing for semi-definite programming. I don't have time to really say what it is, but I'll say the following things about it. First, it's highly you know, geometric. Uh, it's a fixed algorithm, but Analyzing how good it is at approximating, approximately solving CSPs is quite difficult. You have to sort of solve a hard geometric problem to just analyze it. You can run it, but you're not sure what guarantee it has. And I'm going to make this definition. Uh, if you have some CSP called max blah, you see that they all started with max. So some kind of CSP will define SDP sub blah of C basically to be that number S such that this algorithm achieves a C comma S approximation. Okay. 
So it's whatever the STP algorithm gets for this kind of CSP. Now, as I said, it's actually quite difficult to analyze what this number is, but it's something, so let's just make a definition for it. Okay? Again, if you're in the know, uh, you can also think of this as the STP gap, because Raghavendra and Stoyer showed that their algorithm achieves the STP gap. Okay, so it's important to remember this, this notion. So let's just see how this, these two algorithms do on, again, you know, the simplest CSP, max cut, where you have Boolean variables and inequality constraints and some weights. Okay, so the random algorithm, remember, you just pick F at random, okay? It's quite easy to see that when you assign v, V2 and V4, or all the variables independently plus or minus one, the probability you'll satisfy a constraint is a half. Uh, and therefore, in expectation, this random assignment F will have value, you'll pick up half of all the weights, so it'll have value a half. Okay? And that's independent of uh, what the actual optimum is. Okay? So we can say, you can de-randomize this too if you want, and always achieve a half. We would say that the random algorithm here is a C comma a half approximation algorithm. If the opt is C, well actually it doesn't matter, you always get at least a half of the constraints. Okay, what about the STP algorithm? Uh, okay, well by definition, uh, it's a C comma STP sub cut of C approximation. But uh, what is this quantity? Well, luckily, this CSP is like so simple that you can actually analyze this somewhat. And uh, this was done by, in that Gomans-Williamson paper. And they showed that you know, this STP algorithm always achieves at least this much, which we saw before in the case of C56, a half plus whatever, arc sine 2C minus 1. Okay? At least if C is bigger than 0.845, which is actually the solution to some trigonometric equation. Okay, so you see it's already a little bit sophisticated, but you know, they managed to show, and this was quite a breakthrough, that uh, the STP algorithm does quite well for max cut. This is always bigger than a half. Well, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's all I want to say for now about um, the basics of CSPs. And now I'm going to turn to uh, hardness of approximation. So in the previous slide, we talked about you know, algorithms for CSPs and how much they achieve. Now we're going to move to the other side, which is trying to show that achieving a certain approximation quality is NP-hard or UG-hard. Okay. So uh, there's a super famous theorem in this area due to Juan Hostad. You may remember him. He also played a heroic role in Russell's talk uh, as co-author of the Hill paper. Um, so he proved this amazing theorem, which I love very much. He said, remember the max three lin uh, mod two CSP? You have three variable linear equations mod two. He showed that for every arbitrarily small eta, um, achieving a one minus eta versus half plus eta approximation is NP hard, not even UG hard. He did the real thing, NP hard. Okay. So even if I give you a system of three variable linear equations mod two, and it's almost satisfiable, the op is one minus eta, it's still NP hard to get even more than half of the, you know, basically more than half of the equations satisfied. Okay? And this is sharp because, you know, the random algorithm where you assign things at random, it also has the property that it satisfies each equation with probability a half. So it gives a C comma half approximation for all C. So getting a half is easy. I also leave it as an exercise to show that uh, if the opt is one, it's easy to get a, uh, you solve all the equations as well. Okay? So, you know, you can make these eight as small as you want. So this, this theorem is like sharp. It totally resolves three lin. We know how hard it is to approximate. It's very hard. You can't beat the random algorithm. Okay, so how did he do it? He did it by exploiting uh, the distinction between dictators and quasi-random Boolean functions, as we will see. Okay, so that's the connection to the first part of the talk. In particular, he used uh, this theorem, which I'll put in almost a yellow box which I will call the test implies hardness theorem. Okay, it has some terms which I haven't explained yet, but it's the test implied hardness theorem. Basically, it's due to Hostad. This formulation is in this paper with Code, Kindler, and Mossel. It says, if there exists a C versus S dictator versus quasi-random test, I didn't say what that is yet, but it's some combinatorial object, let's say. If there exists a combinatorial object um, using block constraints, this test uses block constraints, then to C versus S essentially approximate the max blah problem is UG hard. Okay? I'll bring this slide back later. So the thing that's really mysterious here is what is the C versus S dictator versus quasi-random test? Okay? So I will now 
to find this, but this is what he used to prove his you know, approximability result. Okay, so informally speaking, a Boolean dictator versus quasi-random test is a way of sort of spot checking a Boolean function f to sort of determine if it's a dictator or a quasi-random function. Okay? Formally speaking, it has an easy formal definition. It's nothing more than a, a constraint satisfaction problem where the variable set is minus one, one to the n. Okay? So formally speaking, well actually this is just the definition of a test. It's just a, you know, a list of constraints uh, where you're constraining you know, this labeling function f on vertices of the cube, also with some weights. And why do I call it a spot check? Well, you should think of a CSP actually in two ways. You know, it's a list of constraints that you want to satisfy. You can also sort of think of it as a spot check on the values of an unknown function f. You know, these p's are suggestive of probability. Think of it as a spot check as follows. You pick a constraint, constraint j with probability p sub j, and then you sort of test that constraint on f. That's a, sort of a probabilistic test, which, you know, the f may or may not sort of pass that test, that constraint. And you're doing this in an effort to sort of decide if f is a dictator or f is quasi-random. Okay. Does the list of uh, spot checks have to be equal over in size? Um, let's say no. It doesn't really matter. You can, in fact, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Uh, okay, so that was really just a test. What is a C versus S dictator versus quasi-random test? Sorry for the heavy notation. Um, it's a test which has completeness C, which means that all of the dictators, if F is a dictator, then when you pick a random constraint, it'll satisfy the constraint with probability at least C. On the other hand, it should have soundness S, which means, dropping all the epsilons and deltas, roughly speaking, that if F is a quasi-random function, it will pass this spot check with probability at most S, plus something that depends on the amount of quasi-randomness. Okay, the so spot check distinguishing uh, dictators from quasi-random functions. And if you recall this one versus two over pi theorem that we proved in the first part of the talk, um, it sort of had this property. I mean, this was a number that was good at distinguishing dictators from quasi-random functions. So one could say that if there were some kind of CSP, a spot check on minus one, one to the n, such that the value of a labeling, a function f, was this, there isn't such a CSP, but if there were such a CSP, then that would be a one versus two over pi dictator versus quasi-random test. Okay? There's actually some CSPs such that the value of the function is kind of related to this, and so you can use that. Okay, so this is an important thing to understand. Okay, so let me bring back this, this test versus hardness theorem that I mentioned earlier. So what it says is that if you can exhibit, or even show that there exists, a C versus S dictator versus quasi-random test on minus one, one to the N, using blah constraints, you know, these might be inequality or three variable linear equations. Remember, these are the, the constraints, the type of constraint in the test. If there is such a, if you can show that such a thing exists, then automatically you get that C minus eta versus S plus eta approximating the associated constraint satisfaction problem is hard. Okay. I hope that makes sense. So it reduces the task of showing you know, a computational intractability result to just analyzing like a combinatorial object about you know, dictators and quasi-random Boolean functions. Is it known for A more complicated thing, you have to construct a more complicated uh, kind of test will give you an NP-hardness result. And actually, that's what Hostad you know, heroically did in his result, which is why he got NP-hardness for his problems. But this is like a simplified version. OK, good. Uh, so it's kind of, this theorem is actually not very hard to prove. And I'm going to give you like a one slide uh, ridiculous sketch of it. I mean, it's not hard to prove, but it would require making like five more definitions and stuff. So I'll just give you like a, the flavor of this result, which is, as I said, not very hard. So it's, you know, it's a hardness result. So let's say we're trying to do it for max three lin. So you need to, again, make an efficient reduction from some problem that you assume is hard to the, the problem that you're trying to show is hard. Okay? So in this thing, you would start with the UG problem, which I won't say what it is. Roughly speaking, the UG problem itself is a CSP, 
where the alphabet size is really large and the constraints are bijective constraints. So again, I'm not really going to explain this, but I'll show you some pictures. So it looks like this. You have some variable set V and some bijective constraints between variables, and there's a large alphabet set. So you're trying to label each vertex or variable with a, some number between 1 and M. And the assumption here is that it's very hard to approximate this. It's hard to tell the difference between the optimum being very close to 1 or very close to 0. Okay. So you need to build the reduction to, let's say, max 3 lin. And what do you have? You have this dictator versus quasi-random test, right? That's all you have. It's a CSP itself of the right type, max 3 lin, on Boolean strings. So what you kind of do is, for each variable over here, you replace it by 2 to the m variables over here, which you associate with like a copy of minus 1, 1 to the m. And you can think of it putting down the constraints on each of these guys that, you know, come from the test. I mean, the, the dictator versus quasi-randomness test is a constraint satisfaction problem. Now, somehow, you also sort of have to hook them together, these constraints together in a way that depends on this original graph, but forget about that. And finally, uh, well, let me say, finally, you have to prove that um, two results, that if the optimum over here is large, then the optimum over here will be at least C. Whereas if the optimum down here is small, then the optimum on this side is at most essentially S. Okay? Now, a labeling over here should give a bit value to all of these copies of the cube. So you can think of it, a labeling over here, an assignment over here is a collection of functions, F sub V, mapping each copy of the cube to minus 1, 1. And uh, to show this thing, if there's a good assignment here that, let's say, gives label i between 1 and m to this guy, then you would take the i dictator function up here. And dictator functions, you know, sort of pass these uh, tests with probability c. So basically, you get, you know, value c everywhere, and the optimum is at least c. This is getting even more, more sketchy. But on the other hand, to prove the contrapositive here, if the optimum in this picture was bigger than s, you would have to be getting at least s on like some of these uh, hypercubes. And so uh, the labeling function for that hypercube could not be quasi-random, because a quasi-random function achieves at most s uh, in this constraint satisfaction problem. So somehow this labeling is not quasi-random, which means that it sort of suggests a small number of coordinates uh, between 1 and m, and then you get like a good labeling back here. OK, so that was like impossible to understand, but I'll call that the end of the proof. Uh, I kind of didn't want to do this, but I think you would get mad if I didn't at least show you a little bit about this proof. OK, so uh, let me remind you what we just proved. We proved this result, OK? So to get a hardness of approximation result for, let's say, max 3 lin, it suffices to construct this combinatorial thing, a, a, a test on Boolean functions that distinguishes dictators from quasi-random functions. Okay? So uh, let us do now uh, Hostad's result. Hostad's result from the, uh, I mentioned earlier about the hardness of max 3 lin mod 2. So just to remind you, he showed that for max 3 lin mod 2, uh, it's very hard for an algorithm to find even an assignment that satisfies even half of the constraints, under the assumption even that there's an assignment satisfying almost all the constraints. So if you remember the, the test implies hardness theorem, you just have to construct an appropriate uh, dictator versus quasi-randomness test, which means, by definition, you need an explicit constraint satisfaction problem over minus 1, 1 to the n, where the, the constraints are linear equations mod 3. Okay, so these are linear equations mod 3 with respect to the, sorry, mod 2, thank you, uh, 3 variable mod 2. Um, now, actually, in this minus one, one notation, this is zero, one notation. So this, a linear constraint actually means this, f of x times f of y times f of z is plus or minus one. OK. OK. And again, we want it to have the following property. If f is a dictator, uh, you'll satisfy almost all of the constraints. And if f is quasi-random, you'll satisfy barely more than half of the constraints in probability. Then you plug in this theorem, and you get the result. So here's the first idea. It's not the correct test, but it's the idea. So remember, think of this as a spot check for Boolean functions. So here's how you randomly spot check the function. First, you pick x and y to be independent random strings. Okay? Then you define z to be kind of their uh, coordinate-wise products. You define zi 
to be x i y i. And then you test the constraint f of x, f of y, f of z equals 1. Okay? That's a constraint of the correct type. It's a three-lin constraint. OK, so let's see how this test does. I mean, this is an explicitly defined constraint satisfaction problem. Uh, so suppose f is a dictator. Let's say it's the ith dictator. Then the probability that this test passes is the probability that x i, y i, z i is 1, which by design, the x i's and the y i's cancel, and it's 1. So that's great. It's even better than what we want. Dictators pass with probability 1. The bad thing, though, is that uh, there's a quasi-random function which also passes with probability 1. Okay? So that's no good. And it's the parity function. Remember, this is the product of all the bits. And if you do this test on the parity function, you get the probability that the product of like, every bit in sight is 1. But again, by the design, like all of the xi's appear twice, all of the yi's appear twice. So uh, the parity function also always passes this spot check. So we failed in our attempt to make a, a dictator versus quasi-random test here. Okay. Now, the, the ingenious idea of Hostad was to do the same test, but I add a little bit of noise. What do I mean by that? So here's Hostad's test, which works. Uh, pick x and y uniformly and independently, and almost define z to be the same thing. But for each coordinate, uh, you know, make it a random bit with probability delta, independent of everything else. But it still tests the same constraint. Now, this does not hurt the completeness of the test very much. If f is the ith dictator function, what's the probability that x i y z i is 1? Uh, the only thing that can go wrong is if you re-randomize the ith coordinate. And even then, it only goes wrong with probably a half. You might re-randomize it to x i y i. Okay? So you fail only with probability delta over 2. OK, so that's close to 1 by making delta small, so no problem. And now you're actually in good shape with respect to quasi-random functions. So suppose f is a quasi-random function. We need to analyze the probability that f x f y f z is 1, given this uh, probabilistic experiment. And you do the Fourier expansion thing. It's actually very much like Ben's uh, proof of Roth's theorem. And out pops this Fourier expression, half plus a half times the sum almost of the cubes of the Fourier coefficients, like in the Roth's theorem proof. But you also have this additional factor, 1 minus delta to the cardinality of s. Okay? This is equal to this. Okay? And that's very nice. Um, so how do you analyze this? Again, you like sort of borrow uh, a factor of f hat s and also this factor out and take a maximum over it. So this is the maximum over 1 minus delta to the s times the absolute value of f hat s times the sum of the squares of Fourier coefficients. Okay? So that's very nice because we know for a Boolean function the sum of squares is 1. So this thing just goes away. And you get that the, the value or the probability of passing the test is at most this. And now we see that if f is quasi-random, we're in excellent shape, right? Because quasi-random means all of the low-degree Fourier coefficients are small, which means that this max is always small. You see, because um, if s is really small, or is small at most a constant, then this guy is small by quasi-randomness. And f is big, if s is big in cardinality, then this exponentially decaying term kills it. Okay? So this is at most half plus little of 1 if f is quasi-random. Okay? And we've established a 1 minus delta over 2 versus half plus something small, uh, dictator versus quasi-randomness test. Yeah? Can you just repeat minus value of f equal to Yeah, so uh, the value of f is equal to this by a calculation. So if you look at this probability, mm, basically if you write it as the expectation of a half plus a half times this product, that's the same as the probability it equals 1. Then you can express, or you can expand f in terms of its Fourier coefficients, and a lot of cancellation happens, and you get this quantity. It's a short calculation. Uh, actually, there's a bit of a lie here that the experts in the audience know about. Uh, we made a little mistake. Um, this is not always small if f is quasi-random, because it could be that f hat, the empty set, is really large. Right? The empty set you know, doesn't have to be small in the definition of quasi-random. Uh, so this could actually be large if f is, let's say, constantly 1. Um, but uh, you can correct that very easily. You just also pick a random bit b and check that f of x, f of y, f of bz equals b. Okay, so it's a minor twist, and I leave it as an exercise for you to check that this really makes it a 1 minus delta over 2 versus half plus little o of 1 uh, dictator versus quasi-random distinguisher. Okay, any more questions? 
Okay. Uh, great. So uh, now I'm going to talk about. Oh, this is a mistake. Cut and paste. Terrible. I want to talk about the hardness of max cut. We just saw the hardness of max relin mod too. Okay. So let's talk about the hardness of max cut instead. So there's also a theorem about the hardness of this uh, from a paper with Kotkinler and Mossel and also Mossel and Oleskovich. And it proves the following result. For max cut, it's usually hard to get a C versus you know, this crazy number approximation out of them. So even if you're given a max cut instance with value at optimum at least C, it's hard to achieve more than this, assuming UG hard means hard. OK, and it's going to follow the same methodology. Uh, and I'd like to point out that I mean, this result is also nice because it shows it's, it's sharp for at least for C bigger than this number because remember, Gomans Williamson gave an algorithm that achieved this much. Remember, I told you this is what the STP algorithm achieves uh, on max cut. It achieves this much. And this is saying that to do better is intractable. So, you know, we've also, this theorem also kind of closes the door on the approximability of max cut, at least for large C. Okay, so we're going to follow the exact same methodology. I'll show you how it works. It's a bit more complicated. Uh, and again, we're going to use this test versus hardness theorem. So remember, in max cut, you have these inequality constraints. So you need to build a C versus whatever, half plus one over pi arc sine, blah, 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 dictator versus quasi-randomness test using inequality constraints. Okay? So you need some kind of spot check for Boolean functions uh, that uses this kind of constraint and is good at distinguishing dictators from quasi-random functions. So it's pretty simple. There's only so much you can do. So this is what uh, KKMO suggested you do. Pick x to be a uniformly random string, as always. And you make y a string which is kind of like a noisy version of negative x. So y is negative x with some probability, and it's a random bit with the remaining probability. Okay, and you test that f of x is differs from f of y. OK. So how well does this do for Boolean functions? Again, we should check the completeness, which is always easy. If f is a dictator function, the ith one, then we're just interested in the probability that xi differs from yi. And again, the only way that can go wrong, if you negate xi, then you're in good shape. Uh, you can go wrong with probability a half times this, which is 1 minus c. So the probability that it goes right is c, OK, just by design. I should have said that c is a sort of a parameter to this test. It's a different test for each number c. Okay, but whatever C is, a dictator will pass this test with probability C, which is good. So now we have the harder task of analyzing the soundness. How well does a quasi-random function pass this test? Okay, so uh, in this paper, we made the following conjecture, roughly speaking, that majority, the majority function, the, the sign of the sum of the bits, is the quasi-random function with largest value. It seemed true to us. And uh, it's not hard to compute the actual value of the majority function. It's this funny number, a half plus 1 over pi arc sine 2c minus 1, plus little o of 1, depending on n. Uh, you used you know, a two-dimensional central limit theorem for that. OK, so therefore, if this conjecture was true, we'd be in good shape, right? Because it would say that all quasi-random functions pass this test with at most this probability. Um, OK, but it's a bit harder than uh, the Hostad case. See, the value, actually, this is a little mistake. The value of f, for a general f, the value of f on this test is, it's not this, but actually it's a half plus a half times this. Sorry for that. But uh, this expression is similar to Hostad's expression, right? You have this decaying exponential factor, and this is even like a, a moderate sized number, 1 minus 2c, but you only have a square here which makes things tough because you can't do this trick of like borrowing one factor of f hat s and still having f hat squared lying around. So I read once in uh, Terry Tao in uh, Von Vu's book about Fourier analysis and arithmetic combinatorics that this problem is what makes the Goldbach conjecture unamenable, inamenable to Fourier analysis. Whereas if you're some, asking about the sum of three primes, then you can attack it with Fourier analysis. Anyway, that's a rumor that I heard. Uh, so it's, it's more difficult than the previous analysis. Uh, but we'll press ahead and see what we can do. OK, so this conjecture that majority is sort of the, the, the quasi-random function which is best at passing this test was proved in this later paper with Mossel and Oleskovich. And I'll give you some kind of sketch of how the proof goes. Again, this will be a, a sketchy sketch. 
So let me remind you of the problem. We have a Boolean function f, and it's assumed to be quasi-random. And we're kind of doing this test where, roughly speaking, you pick x at random, a random Boolean string, and y is also a random string that's somehow um, correlated to minus x. Okay, it's like 2c minus 1 correlated to minus x. As this correlation, the rest is noise. And you're kind of interested in what the maximum possible value of this is, probably that f of x differs from f of y. Okay? Ideally, you want to show it's at most that half plus 1 over pi arc sine blah, blah, blah. OK, so what are you going to do? Um, there's a very, very, very easy first step. Okay? It's a simple observation that the f which maximizes this has to be odd, meaning it satisfies f of minus x is minus f of x. Okay? And so it's OK to stick the assumption that f is odd up here. And then once you do that, you can make this part simpler. You can imagine that y is just correlated to x and that you're interested in the probability that f of x equals f of y. Okay, that's, that's a very simple trick. Um, so it comes down to this problem. Actually, once you get to this problem, you don't even really need that f is odd anymore. You only need that f has expectation 0. Okay, an odd function is equally likely to be plus or minus 1, so it certainly has expectation 0. Okay? So this is, the problem. this is the main task to show this. All right, so how will we do it? It's kind of a generalization of this 1 versus 2 over pi theorem that we did at the beginning, although a bit harder. Um, remember in that theorem, we were concerned about the degree 1 Fourier coefficient squared. We introduced this function L of x, which was the degree 1 part of f. And we argue that it acted like a Gaussian when x is chosen to be random plus or minus 1 bits because of the quasi-randomness fact that all of these coefficients sitting here were small. Okay, and that's what we use to sort of convert the problem to a Gaussian problem and then solve it. So we have to do something similar for this problem. Uh, oof, it's terrible. This is capital L of x, which you cannot see. So uh, you generalize by looking at capital L of x, which is sort of the low degree part of f, okay? Uh, sort of the part of degree up to some big constant O of 1. Okay? And it's kind of okay to look at this. It sort of suffices to study this because, remember I told you this was the formula for the value. And you see it has this very quickly decaying factor. So somehow that says that the high degree parts of f don't really matter much. Okay? So somehow it's enough to study the low degree part of f, which we call capital L. All right, so now, uh, before we use the central limit theorem to show that this acted like a Gaussian, well, that's not true. If you have like a low degree polynomial over r random plus or minus one bits, it doesn't act like a Gaussian. Uh, but it does do something involving Gaussians. There's a kind of invariance principle, first proved by uh, Rotar in the mid-70s, which says that it doesn't act like a Gaussian, but it acts like the same low degree polynomial when you plug in Gaussians instead of random bits. Actually, it's invariance because you can plug in any reasonable random variable with mean 0 and variance 1. Okay? So these GIs here are independent normals. Okay? So he showed that under suitable conditions on these coefficients, this random variable is kind of close in distribution to this random variable. Okay? Also using the fact that degree is constant. Uh, now, I would like to say that it's because all of these low degree Fourier coefficients are small by virtue of f being quasi-random. Actually, that's not quite right. You, you actually need a stronger condition, uh, which if you are an aficionado, aficionado you know that, that uh, all of the influences should be small. The sum of the squares of the coefficients on sets s containing coordinate i should be small for every i. Uh, but it's something like this. And uh, actually, in preparation for this talk, just a couple of weeks ago, I managed to show that this whole proof actually goes through assuming just that f is quasi-random. So therefore, what I'm saying is not a lie. Uh, OK, so by virtue of quasi-randomness and this invariance principle, actually, you need like a quantitative version of it, the kind of the Berry SAN to the central limit theorem, which is provided in this Moot paper. Um, you convert to Gaussians, and that sort of makes your problem into a Gaussian problem. OK, well, this is a sketch. So somehow, it therefore remains to solve a problem about sort of Gaussian functions, specifically this problem. You have a function f for mapping rn to minus 1, 1, and its expectation is 0 under the Gaussian distribution, the n-dimensional Gaussian distribution. We already use quasi-randomness, so that goes away. 
And now you pick a random n-dimensional Gaussian G. And you let h be a 2c minus 1 correlated Gaussian, correlated with g. Again, I'm not exactly going to say what that means. And you try to maximize the probability that f of g equals f of h. So these are like two kind of correlated Gaussians. You pick like two Gaussians, and they're kind of close. And you're interested in the probability that f of g equals f of h. OK, so that's sort of only go, if you think of f as the indicator of a set, it sort of only goes wrong if you know, um, G and H are, one is inside the set and one is outside the set. So this is somehow related to the surface area of the set that F is indicating. And, uh, well, luckily for us, uh, Christopher Burrell solved exactly this problem, essentially, in 1985. So it was actually the second time that Christopher Burrell had saved my bacon. Uh, and he solved this by a symmetrization argument in Gaussian space. So great, so then he solved this problem, and what is the solution? Well, he, just like the Gaussian isoparametric inequality, if you know that, he showed that the maximum, maximizing f for this problem is the indicator of a half space. Okay. And the maximum value of f, this probability, is exactly this half plus one over pi thing. Yes, yeah, Subash. So you want the uh, minimum integer? Oh, you want no, you want maximizer, oh. yeah. It's not trivial. You can't take f to be, let's say, constantly 1 because of this condition. OK, okay that was a very sketchy sketch, but um, what can we do? Great. So that proves uh, overall that this, this Boolean test from, well, I won't go back, but this Boolean test is indeed a, a C versus this number dictator versus quasi-random test. And therefore, you get the associated hardness result for the max cut problem. OK. Um, well, now I come to the last part of my talk. This is, in a sense, all old stuff. It was like over five years ago. So let me just tell you stories about what's been happening in the last five years. So we're done with like technicalities. I'm just going to tell you some stories about what's going on. OK. So uh, what's the first kind of interesting thing that happened? Well, in order to explain it, I want to recall for one second this uh, STP algorithm, this sophisticated geometric algorithm that I didn't quite understand, uh, explain. Um, Remember, we made this definition. Maybe we'll be more formal here and say phi instead of blah. Uh, if you have a CSP of some type phi, we define this number, STP sub phi of C, to be whatever the STP algorithm is guaranteed to achieve. Okay? So if you run the STP algorithm on a CSP of type phi where the optimum is at least C, the algorithm gets at least S, uh, it gets at least this by definition. And again, for those in the know, uh, by this paper, that's the same thing as the STP integrality gap for uh, phi. If you don't know what that is, never mind. But what I want to emphasize is that this number is kind of hard to analyze. It's the solution to some geometric optimization problem. OK? Some explicit geometric optimization problem where you're like taking the inf over something's script i. And uh, as I said, it's hard. So for example, you set up this problem for your favorite CSP, and to determine what the optimizer I star is, is a very hard ge geometry problem. Okay? Maybe sometimes you can do it. Uh, OK, I wanted to remind you of that fact. So now let's get back to what's been happening in the last five years. So first, the next result I want to mention is due to Per Ostrin uh, from 2006. And uh, you know, having solved max cut, which is a pretty simple, the simplest CSP, he kind of went to the next more complicated CSP, which is max 2 sat. Okay? Now, people had earlier worked on the understanding the STP algorithm for max 2 sat. And this number, STP sub 2 sat of C, was partly analyzed in this paper of uh, LLZ. Okay? They didn't do it for all C, and it actually was computer assisted, but you know, they did something. So they kind of analyzed it. It was hard. Uh, and what Ostrin did was very clever. He took the optimizer, I star, that LLZ managed to find, which is some geometric object, and he designed a dictator versus quasi-random test that was kind of inspired by this optimizer. Okay? Uh, so he took this geometric object, and it inspired him to create like a dictator versus quasi-random test, similar to the one from MaxCut. And then he went on to analyze this test using the invariance principle, which you remember sort of converts the question about Boolean functions to a question about Gaussians. And he uh, showed that uh, the quality of this test 
sort of exactly matches the STP algorithm. Okay, so the parameters of the test, the CNS, are exactly C versus this number. And so that was cool. I mean, he resolved the, the difficulty of 2SAT now. He showed that it's UG hard to improve upon this STP algorithm for 2SAT. Okay, so great. So 2SAT was done. So that's two out of very, very many possible CSPs you might be interested in. Um, so the next step was also by Oster in 07, and he looked at things in more generality. So he said, let's just take any kind of CSP where the alphabet is of size 2, and the constraints are on two variables. And, well, here, to analyze how well the STP algorithm does, it's not really understood. I mean, it's an even harder geometry problem, and we don't really quite know what the answer is. But what Ostrin did, I liked very much. It was very clever. Ostrin was like, whatever. Whatever the optimizer I star is, it exists. I'll define a dictator versus quasi-randomness test with phi constraints based on I star. So this I star exists. It's this, it sort of governs uh, what this number is. And I'll build a test that's based on it, even though I don't know what it is. And uh, you know the analysis got a bit more complicated, but he managed to do it. And he proved the following nice result, although it's, it has a, a small problem. Uh, he showed that assuming this optimizer, which we don't actually know, satisfies a certain condition, which probably it does. I mean, he was quite convincing in explaining why the optimizer would satisfy this condition. Then the test he constructed based on it, again, exactly matches. It's this kind of test. And that would show that it's UG hard to improve on the semi-definite programming algorithm. Okay? So essentially, well, there's some gap here. He showed that for every two-area binary CSP, you can't beat the SDP algorithm. The only thing he didn't show is, you know, how well does this, the algorithm do? I mean, the algorithm, you can run it. It gets this much. We don't know how much that is. And he showed that whatever it is, it's hard to beat that. It's quite nice. OK. Now, in this analysis, it was getting like kind of more and more involved because these things are getting more complicated. And you might additionally ask, like, what about CSPs where the alphabet size is bigger than 2? Like, let's say three variable, uh, three variable equations mod 101 or mod 3. And what about constraints on more than two variables? Well, to analyze such a thing, I mean, I think what happened is, you know, Para went to Elkanon Mossel and said, you know, I need a better invariance theorem. So Elkanon obliged. And he kind of uh, souped up the invariance principle in many nice ways. Um, and in particular, the main uh, contribution maybe is new techniques for analyzing tests on functions, let's say from sigma to the n into r, where sigma is a set bigger than size 2. OK, so he got this more powerful invariance principle. And uh, that was potentially useful for further inapproximability analysis. So then came the big breakthrough result that was really amazing and everybody was super excited about. Uh, this is a great result due to Prasad Raghavendra from 2008. Okay? And he showed the following thing. Let phi be any CSP at all. Any size of alphabet, finite, any arity of constraint, you know, finite. Well, he did something similar to, to Austrian. Uh, again, it's really going to be hard to analyze how well the SDP algorithm does, but whatever it is, it has some optimizer, this, this, this quantity, there's some optimizer, I star. And he designed a dictator versus quasi-random test based on I star, actually in a way that was a bit more sophisticated than what Ostrin did. And he had analyzed it with you know, this new invariance principle stuff due to Mossel. And basically, he proved you know, the, the Ostrin result unconditionally. So he proved this very dramatic theorem that it's basically, for any CSP, it's UG hard to improve on what the STP algorithm does. Okay? So he showed for any STP, it's, you know, except up to these like plus and minus etas, which can be made arbitrarily small constants, it's hard to approximate max phi, uh, you know, better than the STP algorithm. Okay? So that's kind of amazing. It says, you know, if you want to approximate a, an STP, just run, or a constraint satisfaction problem, just run the STP, and it's kind of doing the best thing that you can possibly do in polynomial time, assuming that this really means hard. So that was a fantastic result, and I would say it, you know, I want to say it kind of closes mainly the study of inapproximability of CSPs. Well, at least if you assume that this UG conjecture is true, which is a tremendous open problem. But um, assuming that, 
you know, he almost solved everything. There's this issue of the etas, but it's a pretty good result. Uh, there's one sort of except fact, though, that I want to highlight, which I've mentioned before, which is that, you know, given a CSP fee, it's very unclear what this number is. It's some hard to analyze geometric quantity, right? So he says that, well, you run this fixed algorithm, it'll get this much. It's hard to beat that, but how much is this? We'd kind of like to know. So uh, he did show some kind of result along these lines. He showed that if you want to compute what this number is, you can compute it to plus or minus epsilon in some horrible time, doubly exponential in 1 over epsilon. OK, but at least it's sort of finitarily computable. Uh, in a slightly earlier work with Wu, uh, we took on like what we thought is the simplest case, max cut, in this range that was left unresolved by Goldman's Williamson, C less than 0.845. And it was pretty hard. I mean, it was a hard geometry problem. We worked very hard. And we more or less solved it. I mean, we showed that you can compute this number for max cut in time polynomial in 1 over epsilon. But it wasn't like an explicit formula, like half plus 1 over pi arc sine 2c minus 1. It was some kind of weird thing. In fact, even this is not so great. I mean, if you're a true complexity theorist, you would demand that you could compute this in time polylog 1 over epsilon. Okay, so this is actually off by three exponentials from what you would want. Uh, now, in some cases, you can get something very nice. This is one other result I want to highlight due to Austrian and Mossel that actually preceded both of these, um, which says if phi is a CSP that has this condition, it's very simple to check. I won't say what it is, but it supports a pairwise independent distribution. So for these kinds of CSPs, you can actually analyze this and show that SDP sub phi of C is whatever the random algorithm's quality is. Okay? So for this kind of CSPs, and in fact, max3lin is such a CSP, um, it actually shows that it's UG hard to improve even on the randomized algorithm, the totally trivial algorithm. Okay? So it's a very nice you know, result. I mean, it shows like a nice class of CSPs where you, you don't even have to run the sophisticated algorithm. Just picking a random assignment is the best thing that you can do. Um, finally, I'll just mention, just to illustrate that you know, this, this problem of solving this geometry problem, how much does the STP get, uh, algorithm get, it's quite hard. Uh, in particular, if phi happens to be the max 2 lin problem, mod 2, well, the bipartite max 2 lin problem, mod 2, a very simple CSP, then to determine this number is equivalent to determining growth index constant, k sub g, if you know what that is. Something from the metric theory of bonic spaces, which I don't understand, but, well, I know what the growth index constant is. It's basically this, the amount that the STP algorithm achieves on uh, max Tulin instances. So, you know, this is a famous problem. So, you know, these problems are computing these STP numbers are quite hard. Okay, so uh, that's essentially all I want to say. In conclusion, the study of quasi random Boolean functions is quite powerful in many areas like pseudo randomness, social choice theory, and in particular, it's also powerful for uh, the study of CSP in approximability. Um, now, if you assume this UG conjecture that I said you should, then this Raga Venture result, I would say, almost kind of closes the area, except that there's a bunch of hard problems remaining in geometry. OK, but since this is, you know, I work on Boolean functions and, and uh, algorithms, you know, I don't know too much about this area. OK, so uh, let's stop there. Yeah, maybe there's time for one or two questions, if there are any. Or if you're really hungry or you want to find out what happens with Greece and Nigeria. Yes, Avi. Maybe I should uh, say what are uh, problems that are not CSPs for which we don't have good approximation. Yeah, good question. So, so the question Avi was asking about was essentially, you know, what about algorithmic tasks which are not CSPs? Okay, so actually constraint satisfaction problems capture, you know, a large class of interesting algorithms problems, but very far from all such problems. Um, and for these, you're also interested in approximation algorithms, and there are lots of unsolved problems there. Um, so actually, Raga Ventra managed to extend, and others, I guess, uh, yeah, several others, managed to extend this framework to a few more problems. For example, um, ordering problems, where you have like a bunch of variables, and you want to somehow order them subject to a bunch of constraints. Well, it's a bit of a generalization. Um, but there's still plenty more problems that are open. So for example, one extremely nice open problem, I think it's, I would be, love to see any result on this, 
is the, the traveling salesman problem um, where the distances satisfy triangle inequalities. So this is totally not uh, a CSP, um, but the best approximation algorithm known for this problem, uh, which guarantees a result that's at most three halves times the optimum TSP, was from like the 60s or something. And we're very far from getting a, a matching inapproximability result. So there are many other nice open problems in inapproximability of uh, optimization problems. Another question? Okay, let's see. 